Welcome to another episode of the Emulsion Podcast, a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and I'd love to continue the conversation with you from this episode on my online circle community. There you can share your two cents and learn about supporting the show on justinkana.com slash support. For your convenience, it's also linked up in the description of your podcast player. Let's get into the show. What is up, folks? My guest today is Aaron Tecolvi, the chef and owner of Sorel, a new American restaurant located right here in Seattle. This is actually an in-person interview, one of the first in-person interviews in a long time for obvious reasons. I The history that I have with Aaron goes back almost four years, back when him and I were doing pop-ups at the same venue uh, at a place called Whisk on the east side of Seattle. And since then, he's been a peer of mine in ambitious, tasting menu-driven concepts in the Pacific Northwest. More recently, he's gotten his own brick and mortar concept, which is kind of a a far pass away from how he initially started Sorel, and we certainly do talk about that in this interview. If you enjoyed this conversation in particular, I absolutely recommend you queue up my conversation with Chris Spear about pricing your work as a private chef and doing more private events, even though, you know, he has the Chefs Without Restaurants podcast. I think there's a lot to gain from him and I, him and I's conversations. Uh, And I do have uh, it on my docket to talk talk with Aaron about some numbers today, which I'm really, really excited about. So if at any point you want to check out Aaron or Sorel or any of these specific linkable things that we talk about, please check out the description of this podcast or justincona.com slash media where those show notes are always available. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Thanks so much for taking the time, dude. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on. Uh, Been a fan of of the work and appreciate it from afar. Uh, I've always... I've wanted to to do some of this myself, um, but you know how it is. You got to make sure you you stick with what you can do and, and use your time the best. So it's a real pleasure to to be talking with you. If anything else, it's just great to see you. You too, man. It's th- this might be the prettiest podcast shoot location <laughs> we've had so far. Where 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 are we for the people that are either watching yeah. the video or want to know kind of like more about Sorel in general? Absolutely. So we're at twenty three nineteen East Madison Street in Seattle. Uh, it's Madison Valley, which is just over the hill from Capitol Hill, downtown Seattle. Um, we're on the back patio space, which has been where we have, uh, I guess, opened our, our services during our time in the coronavirus. Um, this beautiful piece behind us is something my mother made for the restaurant for when we started dining back here. A fully living piece of uh, artwork, which uh, I'm very fortunate to have such a great mom who's so talented. But yeah, um, it's crazy that this is my restaurant in in the coronavirus. So you know, <laughs> I want to I want to get into like the business side of of all of this in a yeah. second. But the first the first place that I thought would be interesting to start is when did you know that you were good at cooking? As mm-hmm. kind of a reference point of your background and kind of just to give us some quick hits of that, what you've been involved man. with. That, it's a funny question because it, I think like a lot of things, when you reflect back, you know, there's probably times where you're like, ha, ah, I was good at this. And then like you work for five more years and you're like, man, I was, I was not good at this. I would say that when I was a kid, like I started cooking with my mom when I was a little, like four or five years old, she had me in the kitchen with her. Um, you know, we grew up in a really tiny town in Montana. Uh, you know, the word food desert wasn't really a thing yet, but our grocery stores were all California produce. We didn't have farmer's markets. Uh, I was aware of those because my mom's side of the family lived in California. So I would get inspiration from my grandmother and my uncle who was a professional chef and worked as a pastry chef. But, you know, chicken fajitas at like 12 to 14 years old, I was like, yeah, I've got this. And then I went and had like really awesome fajitas somewhere. I was like, I need to, I need to up my game. Like, let's start like, you know, and I was a kid, you know, that time, so I was born in 83, so this would have been, like, definitely in the 90s when I was watching, you know, some of the first food TV before things really exploded in the early 2000s. And, um, but, you know, as far as cooking professionally, I mean, I still get humbled to this day, right? But I feel like I, I gained a level of proficiency probably back in 2014 that I was really proud of. Um, I think before then, like, yeah, there were plenty of things that I could cook and stuff, but I think that my understanding of what I was actually doing didn't get to a high enough point with a broad enough amount of products 
and techniques for me to really like say I'm very comfortable teaching a bunch of people around me, which to me is like, that's when you've maybe reached that level that you can be a little proud of. Also, when you start to have the realization that maybe I am heading towards actually being a chef totally, and not just a cook, like yep. I can teach people and pass this on. So that's when, you know, and that's also when I started doing pop-ups was in 14 um, because I felt that I, I could share something finally that I started to have a voice um, as a cook. And I was like, let's explore this and see where it goes because this was a new medium for me to be creative in because prior to that it was music for you know the majority of my life i started playing when i was 10 and played professionally you know until i was uh what 29 okay yeah so what similarities do you see between the two i i i often see more similarities between chefs and either musicians or athletes than i do mm. to artists mm-hmm which I mean, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts there, but any, any crossovers? Yeah, of, of th there's a ton. So yeah. in, in music and in food, the community of people is very, very similar. The difference in music is that that whole idea of being a starving artist is incredibly prevalent because you can go wash dishes anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world. You can go, you know, do the grunt work anywhere in the world and make whatever the minimum wage is at a bunch of places. And that's one of the beauties of our industry. You will not starve unless you choose to. Right. In music, you choose to start. Mm. And, and that's where too often, you know, people who are in bands will give up a quality of life because it's like, it's all for the art or whatever. When, if they could find a job that worked within what they wanted to do, they would be able to both have a decent quality of life and then, you know, play the music. So for me, like I worked at FedEx and that was a career within itself. Like I worked 40 hours. I was in corporate management. Um, I did training all over the Seattle region, you know, started in Montana. And when we were in Missoula, um, we were playing. That's where we all met in 2003 and started the band. In 06, we moved out here because we were like, Seattle's a great market. It's a big little city. So we can make a big impact on a city that is small and still very neighborhood-like. And so we moved out here and I got a job like three months prior to us moving and it was just, it was strategic. It was like, okay, if I can get over the 90 days, they have to move me with the company and huh. it's paper goods and it's a band. So sure. it's like we need flyers and posters and it was all during the day. So, you know, nine to five, uh, you know, and then go play a show. And even if I had to work Saturdays, we had a show that night. I was still off by 5 PM. Right. And then when I got to management, I was off by 3 PM. So I had more than enough time to like get wherever we needed to. It was awesome. And because I got into the inner workings of their system, wherever we'd play in the country, I knew how to use the, their systems for us to get, because we would go on tour for four months at a time. Once I quit, we were on tour like four months at a time. I knew we could go to these FedEx locations and get products and things that we would need. But with music, you know, the people who are in it, it's very similar. I mean, very, uh, you know, I would say that the chefs I've met most well you know when we talk when the over glorification of like partying and stuff happened yep. i would give more credit to chefs than than rockers i will like it's just different because chefs deal with more stress you know the stress that you deal with in our industry is a very unique one and you know in 2000 i want to say it was 16 they were doing some research study about stress levels and they said that there is a comparable amount of stress in a human's body working in a restaurant as there was in an emergency room with an I ER was going to say something in medical yeah, yeah. I saw I, saw, I think I saw that the, piece. The, when they were measuring you know and I mean it's very obvious in which case who's doing the more noble work it's obviously the doctors sure. but it is interesting to think that there is that so with the musicians they don't experience that it's more so uh you know maybe it's some escapism maybe it's just fun because it is fun to you know party and have a big social group and it's infectious in that way it also keeps you doing it maybe sometimes longer than you should because of the non-stop party and you know my band we were uh very tame in that and the only thing we did was dr drink alcohol and smoke a little weed like mm -hmm. no one was doing hard drugs in our band we knew plenty of others that did and we were at those parties and they always made us feel a little uncomfortable um, but you know, I mean, whatever, we didn't care like you do you, but the people are similar. Um, you know, the instant gratification ends in both businesses, both are there. The, depending on how serious you take your craft and this is in both, uh, you know, there is a never ending ability to learn all different kinds of music forms. 
you know, I know that you were a jazz trumpet player. Totally. I played jazz from 12 through into college. And so especially when you get into that and understand the root of that is in basically all other music, the ability to take that knowledge and then, especially rock music, which is what we played, and use that in a way to become more technical. And I was a drummer. So to me, especially as a drummer, like I would say drummer and a guitarist are going to be the closest, uh, especially a technical guitarist, are going to be your closest in uh, – rock bands to like being as a chef and being a technician in a kitchen sure. and especially people like yourself who are gearheads. Yep. Um, you know, definitely being a guitarist, my, my friend, Pat, you and he would be <laughs> buddies and get way nerd out on that. And he and I would too. I mean, he, I, I am that way. Cause I love the, the science of how everything works, which is definitely what drew me into kitchens because you know, uh, I, I love understanding that because it makes you, if you use that knowledge correctly, it makes you a way better chef. And so it was a very easy transition for me to go from the m music into back into food. Cause I had worked in restaurants, uh, in Montana, you could start working when I was growing up when you were 14 and a half. So sure. I got a job because I, you could also get your driver's license at 14 and a half back then. I got a job in a restaurant, washing dishes, really a uh, small cafe that fr our family friends owned. And then worked my way up as a prep cook and then became a line cook by 16 and then started also working front of house because I wanted to make more money. Um, you know, back then minimum wage was like five fifteen. Yep. Um, I think it's like seven dollars right now. <laughs> uh -huh. And this was in ninety seven. Wow. Crazy yeah, to yeah. think about that. Crazy to mm -hmm. think I'm thirty seven on top of that. But <laughs> um, you know, it was a really great experience though, because it gave me a taste of it and that instant gratification that you would get with music. So the two make a lot of sense. The thing about music for me though, that was different is it was never, I loved it. I loved the guys I was in a band with. I loved touring the performance aspect. Like if you ever, if you ever watch the videos, of like me drumming, I'm very animated, um, very technical, but then very animated when I can be, because it was just the fun performative part of it. But I can't sing to save my life. Uh, when I was in me music, neither. when I was in music school, I had a, a teacher, a professor who, was like, have you ever been checked for being tone deaf? Ooh. Like, you're not full tone deaf, Ooh. but you're like, your ability to rep, uh, replicate tones is very limited. I'm like, I know. He like, but you get a definite A for effort. Cause I would sing, it was awful. Um, but I always felt like I wasn't uh, fully gratified because I couldn't create other things. I couldn't play guitar. Yep. I couldn't play a piano. I'm left-handed. Pianos are built for right-handed people. You can buy a left-handed piano, but they're incredibly expensive. Sure. So like your fly hand, it's backwards. So you can't be, you know, like my non dominant hand, like, no, it, that, that doesn't, it, it was very difficult. I tried, but I still didn't do that all that great in piano class. Uh, so when I got into food, I found this whole new sense of gratification as a creative that I never felt before. The fact that I know how to do like, especially today, like I run front of house, I run the wine program. I do all the tastings. I do all the food. I've been doing all of that for, for years. And I've had other people who come in, um, who've helped me with front of house, who've done things, you know, and obviously when we were getting ready to open the restaurant, I had a full staff. I had two sous chefs, uh, a couple cooks who were going to come on. I had front of house staff. I had someone who was helping co-run the wine program with me because I'm really passionate about wines. But it's, uh, I love the fact that I can do all of these things. And especially when we do when eventually we get back to doing, but have in the past chef counter experiences, that's even more. So it's really easy for me, obviously. And anyone as, as you know, to be right there with the guest offering that kind of experience. And then the performative aspect comes in for me. Cause I love that. I love interfacing. I think anybody who is looking to be in this career needs to understand the value of that. And if you're, there's nothing wrong with being introverted. Absolutely not. Uh, I have plenty of friends who are, but you definitely want to make sure that you're in a certain part of this industry if that's going to be the case because where it's headed right now and where it's definitely going to head post-pandemic or whatever that new normal is, people want that. And there's something to be said. And so what I would urge people to do is like learn how to find that in themselves because once you find that and get comfortable, um, if you're able to get comfortable – it is so much fun and and you find a whole new layer to appreciating this industry that you may have never had before because you never did work out in the front maybe you always worked in a partially open kitchen or a closed kitchen and you didn't have that relationship to guests and uh, you know i know this all stems from like being a little kid and i was in theater from kindergarten through high school i was in speech and debate 
you know, I was in speech and debate. I played hockey. I played baseball. You know, I was kind of – I was friends with every single clique of people that you could have um, in a high school and things. Uh, so it was – for me, it was really great in a lot of ways. But one of the things that I found through the, like, through line, through everything is that I'm very extroverted and I know that and not – Hopefully, no one would perceive me as obnoxiously. I don't. I'm not that like bomb. I'm not bombastic in right. that way. But I have no problem like talking to a stranger. I have no problem like being in a group. Um, and it's a strength. It, like it you is, acknowledge it, it as is. a strength. And you know, sometimes I wish. You know, when I I have some friends who are very introverted. Uh, my wife's brother is much more introverted than I am. But when you talk to him, he weighs his words in such a unique way, and he listens so intensely that sometimes, like, I have to. He, that inspires me to be a better listener, right? And so when I've met those people over the years, you know, uh, I have a lifelong goal of learning how to be more concise because I'm a talker and I get that. <laughs> My dad, we would be in the car after a little league game and he'd just be like talking to the other team's coach. Like, and my mom would be like, what is going on 30, 45 minutes later? I'm like <laughs> ridiculous. Yep. And I know I get that, but I'm, I'm very, I love what we do. And especially the more you get into it, the more you meet people who are in it, chefs, all of our purveyors, the farmers. And then you like, you meet like people in the wine industry who are very similar to us, salt of the earth people. You want to share that. I do. I want to share their story and what's happening because it's just so exciting. And then also like, I mean, if people ask me like what restaurants to go to in Seattle, I'm like, I got so many for you like to check out. And I want to share these things because the more people go out and have great experiences, the more they will go out, which helps our industry. And especially if I can point them in the right way, um, it's important. So, you know, this is all to say, um, you know, short story long, uh, that <laughs> I, I really have always enjoyed the performative aspect of anything that I've done. And, um, and I love people. Uh, even, you know, working at FedEx is as weird as this is to say, I would actually recommend that people work somewhere like that, like in customer service, because especially like FedEx gave you, like for us, they gave us so much training. It was insane. And like you roll your eyes a little bit, but when looking back at it, I'm like, that was so valuable, just as like a basic customer service representative. But then when I got into management, I mean, they sent us away. Like I spent a week and a half learning how to read P&L statements and, you know, analyze business and do forecasting and under, you know, what company does that, right? You need to usually go to school for that. Um, or you need to have been in school and then that company's gonna show you their proprietary way of how they do it. It was a really amazing experience for me to have that. And, and but it taught me from working there so many opportunities um, to de-escalate situations with guests because especially since it was a printing and shipping business, you know, people would be irate about their shipping and they still are, right? Those poor reps. It takes a very special person to work <laughs> on there, especially when they're getting screamed out on the phone. Like I can't even imagine, I, you know, but there's all these little techniques, right? Yep. Like for those of you, a really simple one is this. If somebody is being irate and you have the opportunity, bring them away from everyone. That's number one. Say, hey, would you please just step over here with me? And most of the time they will. Like, I really want to take care of you. Say something like that to the effect of, and then lower your voice down. Talk calmly. Don't ever try to meet them. Have them meet you. And psychologically, we talk at a similar level of those who talk Mimetic. to us. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and it works. And it absolutely works with guests at a restaurant because you're going to have people you're going to um, maybe even have fellow co-workers who get crazy about something and you need to calm them down um for a variety of reasons but with guests too you know and uh you know there's a little fake it till you make it with that there's a little just making sure that you can preserve the experience for the rest of the guests um, and other guests that are around, you know, if it's one table where somebody's just unhappy about something, you know, queuing in on that, there are ways to, to do it. So this is all to say, like FedEx taught me a lot and uh, it was a really, it's so strange because there's so many other things about working in a corporate world where like, I mean, gag me, like, let me tell you, I got back from tour in 2010. We knew the band was going to be coming. Uh, I think if you asked me then. I would have known that we were going to be calling it quits eventually, but our lead singer had suffered a really terrible back injury and had to have his L5 S1 disc replaced in his back. 
Um, it was that or a fusion, but there was this study being done to help legitimize insurance claims. And so they funded the research to have him have the surgery because it's like $130,000 surgery. Wow. And so he ended up going through that. He had like 10 years of health care with them so that they could study him. And it was really great. But the problem is in the music industry, as soon as you start saying no to anything, they quit calling. It's That's all about reputation. what can you do for me now? And we were just starting to pay our rent. And we we're just starting to make enough money to like pay some basic bills. And then we had to start saying no. And I, at the same time, was like losing my love for because I did all the business for the band. Um, I was not being creative at all anymore and started to like resent going to practice. It was just – it's not good. I was just burnt. I was really burnt out. And I'm kind of fortunate this happened around when I was like 26. So this is, you know, about 12 years ago when I really started to have burnout in the in that business, which helps me have foresight in this industry to not have burnout, like how to take care of myself better to prevent that from happening. Um, so so I went back to FedEx in 2010 and started working for them. And I worked for them for a couple of years while I was trying to figure out where I was going to go. And about midway through, I started culinary school and was working full time there, was going to school full time, got a private chef gig, was doing that and started working at a restaurant part time, then to full time um, because I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember like really any of 2011 uh, because I was just so in it yep. so deep. But, you know, though I had cooking skills and worked in restaurants, I wanted to go to culinary school just to get updated on and to get networked, hopefully. That was like my other thing. So I was willing to pay a couple extra bucks to make that work rather than just jump in because I didn't know where to. Sure. Um, and so it's kind of that, that idea of, you know, paying to kind of skip ahead a little bit yep. versus grinding it out forever. Um, you know, and to me, knowledge has always been the, that, you know, as cliche as to say, it's, it's power in that way. If you can educate yourself a little bit at a right value, because the whole culinary school conversation is a whole other one to have. Sure. I have very, very <laughs> specific feelings about that. But um, and it can be very positive. But that's a whole other thing. A couple threads I want to pull yeah. on from all of that. I think that's, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts if. I've I've already basically shared that I think that there's more comparisons to drawing the correlation between chefs hospitality more chefs than anything else because that's that's where I come from to musicians mm -hmm. but I think it's really interesting how musicians have this capacity to genreify themselves mm -hmm. almost from the sense of I am a rock drummer I am a jazz bassist and in the culinary world, we don't have that type of specialization. And so it, it not only, I think it causes a little bit of identity crisis and it also f makes people feel like they are lesser than mm -hmm. by going either deep or, you know, like, or it, it could go the other way where, where they feel like they can't take advantage of an opportunity because I'm not a fine dining line cook. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? We don't have that same categorization. Yeah. So. I don't know. Would we benefit from something like that? Yeah. I mean, I think some of that exists. I think especially in traditional restaurants. So, you know, uh, 20 years ago when it was like, this is an Italian red sauce place or this is northern Italian cuisine. This is a French bistro restaurant. Like when restaurants were very traditional in the cuisine they cooked, I think that that is more akin, like more similar to like I am a rock drummer. Like I think that there's a little bit of that. I think now – you know, when you say you're a modern American restaurant, what the hell does that yep, mean? Yep. I mean, that can mean a million and one things. You could be cooking burgers <laughs> or you could be a restaurant like Eden Hill. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Or like what we do, like yep. at Sorel, like there's a it, there is that. So I think that I think that there is definitely like when it comes to identify like identity, it can be really hard. And I think that depends on who you are as a person too, like how much that matters to mm. you. Um, and I think some of it does matter for sure. I think that in restaurants and for people who work in them, you know, I, I think you have to be careful about doing too much too fast. I think like study Italian cuisine or study Israeli cuisine or study whatever it is, like focus on that for at least like a decent chunk of time. Cook that food for some months on end, like fail at it a bunch, learn how to do it, right? Like teach other people how to teach do it. Teach other maybe. people how to mm. get to the point to where you have a proficiency that you can start teaching other people. And when you've reached that, you're like, I'm comfortable. Okay, 
next thing. Mm. You know, you don't read a book a quarter of the way and then ditch it and move on to the next one. You finish the book. And this isn't, you know, you're, I'm not saying master the cuisine because unless you get really inspired and that's all you want to cook, right? Because we know people like that, like Cafe Juanita and Spinace. Mm -hmm. They're northern Italian um, restaurants. Uh, Stuart, like, is immersed in that. Uh, Holly and her chef cuisine, Lauren, like, they absolutely are passionate about northern Italian cuisine. Maybe you find something that, like, keeps you in that only. But for people who, like, have a, a wanderlust and have, like, these ideas of other things, like, spend some time so you have proficiency because you should understand, like, you know, how maybe certain spice blends are made. It, you know, do you know how to make a garum? Like, do you know how to make a curry spice mm -hmm. curry spice isn't just like curry spice there's a plant called totally. curry that you like it mm -hmm. isn't like cilantro and coriander right like it's not yep so but do you know like how mm -hmm. that works and 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 make uh, spend some time and learn these things because once you do you'll get to a point to where you're going to have this massive palette to choose from a then, repertoire yeah. it's like the old school french yeah, way of looking exactly. at it right but you have all of these ideas to pull from mm -hmm. and i think that when you talk to someone in music like my friend pat and our uh our singer todd who he played guitar you know they could actually compose songs because like as a guitarist if you can sing you can write music all day you know um at least marketable in america right there's plenty of other things but you know if we're just talking simply like you can if you have the ability to compose you have this palette to be creative and so not to mix too many metaphors but i always think of it like a, a paint palette like you're just adding more color to what you can do so you can paint a bigger picture or multiple different kinds that don't look it's not just red green and blue you know sure. now you have all these different shades of it and i think like as a as a cook like you need to be a cook for mm -hmm. a long time mm -hmm. you also need to spend time in a restaurant like you should plan anywhere that's good to work at you should spend two years at at least at least maybe max of four unless you're moving up but it depends on how many stations there are but this idea of nine to 12 months somewhere is the biggest your way you are doing yourself a disservice because you will not have learned a level of proficiency within that restaurant until you're there for a year you're not even gonna know where everything goes probably unless it's just a teeny tiny restaurant but just to know enough about the dishes to have certain you know maybe even recipes that you do on a regular basis memorized or anything you need to spend some time so that's where you got to take some time to vet places but you want to spend some time to gain proficiency and i'm not saying that you need to like go be a line cook for 10 to 20 years before now you're eligible to be a chef sure. it's not you know, or a chef owner or whatever, but you do need to spend a little time like doing this. And it also depends on what else have you done in your life? The skill stacking. Well, I was going to touch on that because there, 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 there's a lot of people who even pre pandemic come from other industries and say, yeah. I'm burnt out from this nine to five, or I don't want to be an accountant anymore. I want to like, I just, the only thing that speaks to me is food, but I feel like I'm too late. Mm. To me, hearing your story coming from two separate industries and having dabbled in food and having that kind of ingrained love for it, there was this element of, I'm not going to look at these previous lives of mine as sunk cost. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use them to almost like develop this self-awareness to s tell myself, you know, like there's value in all my experience and leveraging that into being a chef. I guess, do you have anything to say to someone who is either kind of like hesitant to make that jump mm. or they're kind of like in that transitionary time and they're a little yeah. uncertain. They feel like, you know, I just spent <laughs> six years going to school for something else and this doesn't match with what my family thought that I thought I was going to do, you know, kind of like what, what goes, what would you say to someone who's going through that? It's funny because I recently, one of my favorite podcasts, they have a, a feedback Friday where they answer listener questions and stuff. And someone literally uh, about three months ago, had e had emailed it about this exact topic and i heard it and felt so strongly that i sent them an email and said if you want to connect us i am more than willing because i just want them to have full awareness of what this industry is and how much work it is and like this guy is making like almost a quarter million dollars a year doing his job that's mundane to him but i'm like okay what i would say to people who are thinking about changing careers into the food industry is i'd ask them one why like the real why like do you just love cooking for people 
And if you do, like you love that idea of you have this table of people and you're like passionate about cooking for them. Do you need to work in a restaurant? Like things aren't the way they were five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, for sure. If you really love that, what I would say is like, you know, maybe what you need to do is once a month, hold a supper club and you're just going to cook some family style dishes or whatever it is and do that maybe to start to see if that suffices that need that you're feeling rather than dropping everything, working in a restaurant, realizing that you're going to make minimum wage probably when you start because you have no skills. Even if you go to culinary school and you go to Johnson and Wales and you pay $120,000 plus depending, you know, or whatever it is these days, but it's like six figures. It's ridiculous. And then you go and you realize that this was all over glorified by TV media and what you should have done is probably go to a community college and you spend, you do their two year program while you get a small business. You like do an AA at the same time, or at least take a few classes, which would be better for you. This is also for like 18 year olds going to college advice too. But for those who are going to change industries, you know, you have to understand like, this is a lot of work and this is a lot of work in a way that you probably don't know unless you're like a, day laborer mm -hmm. who's done construction like I have like that's what I did that in my like early 20s sure um this is even harder than that because there's a whole other level of stress Jason and, Freed talks about the difference between hard work and challenging work yeah. you know like you can have like emotionally taxing like mental work with, like that a lot of people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis but like cooking a on a line yeah. every night is hard work it's physically That's hard work it's Correct. physically demanding it's emotionally demanding depending on who you work for and here's the other thing people are not used to being talked to like we do in a restaurant in a, the military is the only place and maybe in hospitals that i've heard of the shorthand talk that we have there's no emotion to it it's like you know uh, one steak two fish do this do that and it's and it's you know, and you call back, right? Yeah, like, and call back. <laughs> yep. And then if you're not, it's like, did you hear me? Yep. And it's it's not meant harshly mm. or meanly. Well, it shouldn't be. Mm. But, you know, you have to understand, like, it's not. And people do get offended. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be perfectly transparent, like, my wife started working with us when all this hit because she lost her job. Uh, she's a teacher and was uh, working in child care at the time. And so she started working with us. And I was the idiot that <laughs> thought I, like, was good enough uh, at managing people and I am in the community of people who were, and it's actually really great that she worked with us, but I started talking to her a little too short and she got a little like, yeah. nippy, it's like snippy with me one day. <laughs> and I'm like, I started laughing to myself cause I'm like, I'm not measuring this correctly. Mm -hmm. Like my wife is here doing an amazing job for us. And I'm talking to her like she was a normal server and the normal server would have no issue sure. because they get it. Like it's not meant in any other way and i've always put a please and thank you on everything that i do because my mom taught me that when i was young so i've always done that but people aren't used to that mm -hmm. and so so there's a lot of different things um but what i would say is like if you're going to get into this industry don't do not quit your job don't because if you aren't willing to work your job that you currently have full time and also work in a restaurant like a day or two a week not as a stage, but you should get a part-time job, right? If you can't handle all of that, you can't handle this industry because there are going to be so many weeks you're going to be demanded to work that much, right? And so, like, be willing to work a six-day work week, right? Like, just know what that feels like because if you can handle that, then you have a chance. Like, then maybe – because then maybe you're onto it. I'm not trying to say, like, this is, like, drudgery. It's not. It's just, like, even at the best that this industry can be – it is still a lot of work and you have to have a certain pain tolerance for the suffering that happens with it because, and this isn't to over dramatize. It's just the truth. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I was last week, I worked 81 hours and there's a variety of reasons for that. There were just some things that happened. Um, we had terrible weather Saturday. Uh, it was too cold and there was a bunch of snow. Like it was 28 degrees Friday night. We were out here and I got to say, customers were so happy people were taking the jackets off because these heaters and the way that we put things up, they were super happy. But Saturday, a foot of snow dropped yep. about, and we, I chose to close the restaurant more for, um, my safety in driving here. I mean, I'm from Northwestern Montana. I'm not afraid of it, but I'm worried about other drivers. Mm -hmm. I'm also worried about getting just stuck and I don't want to deal with that, but I'm really worried about drivers. Like if you're anxious and you get to the restaurant after driving and you're anxious about leaving, 
and just carry that with you while you die. And that's not a way to experience what I want to give you. So we rescheduled everybody to Sunday. So <laughs> we were like Wednesday through Saturday, Sunday. And I'm like, I never wanted to open up a restaurant. What am I doing? I have a five day a week restaurant this week. My goal was to like circumvent all of this by my crafty way of opening Sorel and doing all this and pulling like a, you know, behind the, you know, behind the back shot and sinking the three that, you know, in business because, and we will get back to that eventually. But, you know, for right now, we are basically like a restaurant. It is so weird to me because this is not what I had ever planned to do. So, you know, but my knees hurt today. Yeah. 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 They're sore. I sure. mean, I feel it. I, and I'm like, you know, and the, the, so, but I also want people to know like this industry is beautiful. And when you work with the right people, there's so much learned, so much to do. You just have to be okay that unless you go work for a corporate entity, you're going to probably max out at about $75,000 in most cities. Unless you go maybe to New York, right. you know, New right. York, San Francisco, LA, you might be able to get a corporate job somewhere where you break six figures, but no, you're going to work a lot. And a lot's going to be demanded of you. And a lot of times those jobs, like they want people with, um, extra education and stuff like those, or you've worked your way through the ranks and you've earned your way up. But you know, I would say this, like, are you comfortable making $60,000 a year at most? Um, are you okay working 60 hour weeks on average? Just on average, you might have a 40 every now and again, but on average, unless you want to be like the Postiola somewhere, that's a sweet gig. Um, but you're probably not gonna make that much money. You're gonna probably make like 45. You know, you gotta ask yourself these questions. Like, will that, you know, if you're someone who made a bunch of money in another career and you're like, I just want to do something fun, to totally different conversation. But if you're like, I actually need money for a livelihood, you gotta make sure that you understand what you're getting into before you do that. So, you know, and think of it almost like a side hustle. Sure. You know, work, you work your full-time job while you're doing your side hustle. You could treat this the same way. And then when you have gotten to maybe a level of proficiency and also like prove to yourself that this is something you wanna do, and maybe you could have your own business where you might make some more money or whatever it is, then maybe you segue in. But don't quit that day job you have because that's your lifeline to be able to do this other stuff. If, and this is exactly what I told the other guy. And he decided to um, go about things a little differently, which uh, we had a really awesome conversation about it. And I appreciated that. I just, um, I think, and I know this, cause I know other people have gotten into this industry. I also know the failure rate of this industry. And I know that like, when they do the statistics of like graduating classes from culinary schools, you know, 5% you hear about a lot is all and you're telling me that just for basic math, a hundred people went to CIA or went to, they spent $180,000, 100000 to go to school and 95 of them. So you're talking almost a million dollars was paid to that school. And only uh, 10, 5%. What? Sure. What kind of investment is that? Totally. Like, so, and, and you know, hopefully things will change a bit in our industry that will make that turn over uh, better, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be any time that soon. I mean, it's a little better, but it's, we've got a lot of cultural changes that need to happen, but the work's always going to stay about the same. Yeah. So I'm hearing there's this, um, there's this exercise in, in, in stoicism that is very like reduce yourself all the way down to the philosophers talk about like, wearing rags for clothes and just eating mm. bread and that kind of stuff so that you can see how bad it could actually be for yourself. So I'm, I'm maybe hearing you say that if you can lay all those things out on paper, envision what your life would be like mm -hmm. in a, in a lifestyle like that, and you're still happy, then it's probably a good decision to make. The yeah. Change. I think bare minimum, you have to go through an exercise like that just for beginning qualifications. Like, because you don't, you do not want to drop everything that you're doing and get into this and then realize like, wow, I just worked, which happens with people in this industry. I just spent five years making barely any money with the hopes that something else would happen. But because of working so much, I never took the time to point myself in the right direction that I should be headed to do better. Right. Or, you know, or to make these changes. And that's, you know, that's a constant issue in our industry. I mean, I would say, you look at the the group of servers who like were aspiring to do other things and started this, but it's like, man, I work three and a half, four days a week and I make 60 grand a year. Sure. This is awesome. And, and, but they could have like, you know, they were, I know two people who were going to school 
one uh, that would have made way more in the careers that they were going to have, but like stuck around. And it, this isn't to say they don't love it, but they're, you know, I mean, I think right now, given COVID, they probably wish they may have stayed. I don't know. Right. Uh, right. But yeah, it, I do think that you have to really like think about that life. Um, you know, that all said, though, if you do choose to get into this, you know, and I would say the exact same thing to somebody who's very young, who's like out of high school, who's interested or in high school and interested. You need to make sure that you vet out the restaurants you're going to work at to find people who are willing to teach because that is, in my experience, I've been very lucky to have people who were willing to teach. But those who I know and plenty of other restaurants that I've heard about, uh, that doesn't sound as common as you think it should be because of the bad tradition of it just being here. Figure it out. Here, figure it out. Oh, and I'm going to yell at you when you don't figure it out, but you were never taught to do it correctly. It's like trial by fire always. And that has been in our industry in every level of it, except McDonald's, except all these multi-billion dollar companies. You know why? They train you. They take the time. They care about because they know that whole adage, you know, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach a man to fish, he'll eat for life kind of philosophy if you take the time to invest that into someone and then you also give them some basics like decent pay like oh i don't know a retirement plan which no one except like a few of us do and that's a bit that was a huge thing for me with opening this place is like we're gonna at least give you the option like you should invest in a ira and we will put money toward you know from your paycheck toward, towards that every month uh if it's a 401k but ira yourself a little bit better in that way because you can take it wherever you go we can help you develop that whatever um, health insurance, you know, which has been a huge topic, but I mean, only those bigger companies do these things and they invest a little bit. And then when you hear about people staying with companies for years on end, who've done those things, it's no surprise that, you know, you have chefs who've worked within the same restaurant group for years because they're well taken care of. It's a joke. I remember when my friend Ben started with Renee Erickson, um, she hired his whole company to live within hers which does not happen. True. That is like the rarest thing. He is, his company, Ben's Bread, is built on everything. It is so cool to see that. And that just shows how much respect. And the sous chef that he knew from there was like, uh, yeah, sure, we'll see if you stay there for only two years. Because that was kind of like what he said. Yeah, I can give you two years and get things going. You know, I'd see there four or five years later, right? And he like has such a great situation with them. And he might leave to do his own thing because he still has aspirations of that. But I think that when you're given autonomy, you know, once you reach a certain level that you're given some decision making power when you're respected and you're given some of these base things that are important, um, you do want to stay around. And it's a good culture and that stuff. Uh, so, you know, to those who are trying to get into this industry at any level, make sure that you uh, look at the places, maybe interview an employee if you can, or at least like. You know, an interview with a prospective employer is as much an interview for them as it is for you of them. And you got to take that in and you should ask questions and you shouldn't be like scared about that. Because if you are and they're intimidating you in that way, it's a lost opportunity to make sure you're going to fit within them. Um, it's why I'm sad about like this, the staging culture uh, being so messed up. I think there's a way to get back to that, whether it's a modified form of internship or something like that, where you just get paid minimum wage and you're there or a modified wage. Um, and that's there, what we do when we train people. We, we pay them, yeah. but it, but it's a working interview. Yeah. You know should, what I mean? It, and it should be, I mean, mm -hmm. they're doing work and, mm -hmm. and also like, uh, you know, there's a respect level to that. Um, I remember hearing about like stages. They didn't get to touch product. Like they mm -hmm. just were there to like, stand and watch and mm -hmm. i'm like what is the point mm -hmm. what's the point like but you got to find these places you got to find people who are willing to do that and then you got to make sure that the culture of the place is something like so you better have eaten there i can't even tell you how many cooks i know who've never eaten at the restaurant they worked at totally. that's the most absurd thing i've ever heard mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you gotta love that place i remember when i had my first meal at lark there was it was a a bite of porchetta and it was stuffed with nettles and cured black olives and it had this jus, this this olive jus. And it was like the best bite of my life in that moment. I was so floored by this dish. It was just, it was perfect. It was perfectly balanced. It was absolutely delicious. Um, 
And you should love that. You should just like how passionate people get about sports teams. You should want to be that way about the business you're at. Otherwise, why are you there? Yeah. So do all those things. And then, um, you know, make sure personally when you work at a restaurant that you have hard set times that you take vacation for a week. And be disciplined about it. And be very disciplined. Know the frequency in which you need to recharge your battery. Now, I'm getting better at this. My wife has been instrumental in helping me get better at this because she's a, a sane person. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love to work because the job is so gratifying. And, you know, I picked up a couple new skills in the last year now because of Coronaverse. Like, I do, I do everything. All the pastry work. All the breads, uh, I love making bread. I have bread dough's working right now. Uh, I do both yeasted and naturally fermented. Like, I take a lot of pride in that. Ben, who I was just mentioning, is my guru, and anytime I have questions, I go to him. He's a grain nerd, as in, like, the grains <laughs> yep. that you make flour from. Sure. So he's great to talk to because he cues me in on people to work with protein percentages, all the nerdy stuff. I mean, he go he's the guy who goes to grain conferences. Like, you want to talk about Wild. somebody who's nerdy. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. And so I just go to him and, and have these great conversations. And, um, but that's, that's again, things that enrich me to want to be in this industry. So again, I'm not throwing shade at our industry. I just want the, you need to not just look under the skirt, but like have the whole thing stripped back. So, you know, cause, uh, once you do, you can then assess where you want to go and, and write out those plans. Like I know it's so cliche, like there's all these new things and, I know um, there's this thing called a, a bullet journal, which I've heard about. And I think that there's some great philosophy in that. Like some people need more of that structure given to them um, to, to help uh, organize their thoughts into something they can put into action. And, you know, yeah, you could maybe roll your eyes at that. But at the same time, I'm not cynical like that. I'm like, that's awesome. If that tool helps you get better at what you're doing, good for you for being humble enough to like invite that into your life versus going, ah, I can figure that out. I, I don't need, you know, like guys, we don't need to all reinvent the wheel. Just make it better, make a better wheel. Cause guess what? Everything has been done. There are very, very few, very few original ideas out there. Um, and anytime you think you have made something original, guess what? I bet I can jump online right now and find somebody who's done it before you. Sure. It doesn't mean your version isn't great. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't be proud of it and you shouldn't work hard at it. But just like a little humility goes a long way. Um, but I think like taking those times, those breaks and understanding like what you need personally to recharge so you don't have burnout um, and so that you don't start resenting the industry you're in, which is exactly what happened to me in the music industry. I hated it. I will tell you that it took almost five years for me to really start listening to music consistently again wow. after I got out. And I still have ebbs and flows with it because – something got lost with me back then and i just like fell out of love with music and you know my one of my all-time maybe my all-time favorite band probably is my all-time favorite band is coed and cambria they brought me back because i went to a few shows of theirs and then i was like okay i remember that feeling that unique feeling you get at a show when you know all the lyrics to everything brought me right back into it um but i think like you you gotta you gotta know what you're getting into with yourself you gotta know yourself in that way sure. um and take care of yourself and that's where like i'm so proud that mental health and these things are finally being addressed that we're having more and more conversations and we'll continue to have more and more conversations about them um and people need to not be shy about that because this is a really hard time for people i mean i'm the fortunate one and this is an absurd thing to say maybe um for people who don't know like the full stories of what have happened but you know i was scheduled to open up my first restaurant march 19th of 2020 Jeez. Um, i had passed on six other locations that i'd looked at over the last three years because of random random reasons uh you know uh management company in california like i was going to open up, up in calif uh in capitol hill Management company in California was trying to dictate to me the hours my business should be open. They have no idea what it's like in Seattle to run a business, what people actually look for. They're like, yeah, you need a lunch service and all this. I'm like, you know lunch isn't a thing in Seattle. This is not a lunch city. Like, yes, people go to lunch, but predominantly, like, lunch is a is a lost leader kind of service right. um, in, this, in this area. So had to pass on that. Um, there was a place actually the close – the place I looked at just prior – 
to this one, I was getting a great deal in Fremont. There's a brand new building going in. It was a five-story building on the base. It was going to be the restaurant. It was 1,200 square feet, so it was small. I had another 250 square feet outside for a back patio area with cooking set up. Um, the landlord, after going back and forth and doing deals and proving my case to them about like the enrichment that I can give to the 75 tenants, the potential tenants that they'd have, he quadrupled the amount of TI that he was going to give me. Jeez. It was insane. Like it was great, but I was just like, this either, there's no gray. It's yes or no. I yeah. can do this, but I'm not footing the full bill for the build out and stuff. Then the company that did the, the quotes, like totally screwed up the way that they were doing it. It ended up being way too much money and I had to back out. I'm like, I'm not gonna go half a million dollars in debt for a tiny restaurant. Like I'm not now other people might have a bigger sense of risk, uh, willingness to take that kind of risk, but I'm pragmatic in things like I'm taking my time. It's right. Why I ran just a pop-up at private dining catering company for five years prior to taking the space over really being careful because I had a max. I'm like hundred grand. That's the most I'm going to invest the most doesn't mean that there won't be more over time that, but it'll be money that we generate. Mm -hmm. But as far as borrowing, I don't want to do it because if I do it privately, I'm going to let people down. If I do it with the bank, I'm going to ruin myself through bankruptcy or whatever else. I don't want to do that. I want to be very careful with how I do things. So passing all these things got approached by my now landlords who were looking to buy this space, asking me if I'd be interested in cooking them a, a Christmas Eve dinner. And I have never worked. I'm maybe the only person in our industry I've never worked New Year's Eve. I've never worked Christmas wow. Eve. Wow. Ever. Interesting. Now, I came because of coming from FedEx, and I have a very close relationship with my parents and my my brother, my immediate family, um, and actually most of my mom's side of the family I'm pretty close to too, but I'm always, like the one tradition, I have never missed a Christmas with my parents, ever, and that is very important to me. It's we. It's really the only tradition we have. We're kind of a non-traditional family. We're not religious or anything like that where there's more built-in reasons uh, why you get together and stuff. Um, and so we see each other regularly, but it's, you know, like a lot of people, it's just like whenever. So yep. I always took these dates off and uh, you know, we were closed because of working for a corporation. You're just closed. I got into this industry. I'm like, I don't want to be home for Christmas Eve. So at that time I was able to weasel my way around it when I was working for other people because my parents lived in Montana and I had to drive home or fly home. So I'm like, everybody else had family locally. I'm like, ah, I really need this time off. And I also was like asking for it way in advance. I was just making sure like mm -hmm. I'm getting this time off. Um, and, you know, uh, whatever. Right. Like I, I know I'm sure some of my fellow employees were like, God, why is Darren get it off? But I'm like, ah, well, you should ask like, you know, first come first serve when yep. it comes to dates off. So, you know, it was always important to me to, to have that time. And this kind of goes back, like everybody should take those time off that time off. Like you're disciplined about it. You have to be, mm. uh, but it's hard. Cause you know, when you're a business owner, sometimes you get that anxiety in you where you're like, well, if I don't do this, like yeah, this va is vacation happen. guilt. Yeah. Right. So, so they approached me in December uh, about cooking Christmas Eve dinner. And I was like, Hmm, Sorry, like I'm unavailable then. They're like, oh, okay, no big deal. What was funny was that the year prior, I had recommended Brooke, yes. our mutual friend, to yep. cook dinner for them. And then they went back to her for that year and asked her, and she recommended me, which oh, is really geez. funny. So it's like this ping pong <laughs> recommended me. And I was like, yeah, I know. They're like, oh, well, we're buying this building. Would you be interested in looking at it? And I was like, what's the address? And I was like, I, was like, I, I know where that is. So that kind of started things. And then we got along famously. They are, it's a couple, they're two wonderful people, both very business minded, but very different ones a more creative ones, more like hardcore business and law. So it's awesome to work with them because my brain is on both sides. And so I can have great conversations with both. And again, I like almost like an employer, like I'm interviewing them. Cause I'm like, I'm going to be t tethered to these people for 10 years potentially I have a five and five with a renew potential renew after that. So that meaning that I have a five year lease and then I have an option to renew for another five, but it'll be potentially at a different, um, rent depending on what our negotiations are. But when you go to find a restaurant space, I cannot stress enough how important it is that you really like your landlord. 
like you would be cool inviting them over for dinner. If you're not, that's not the right person for you. It needs to when you run a restaurant and there are as many issues and the whole COVID situation has exposed this in a way that is I mean, I know landlords are being have been unmerciful. And especially corporate ones because they don't want their portfolio yep. to lose value. So they're like, we don't care. We're going to kick these people out. Um, we're not going to give them discount rent because then our assets look like they're worth less. I mean, no heart at all, um, which is another reason why maybe private landlords are a better way to go because maybe they will have more heart, though I know some of them from some stories from some friends who are also being heartless. So this is to say like – don't just think of it as just a business transaction when it's a restaurant. Maybe other businesses can function differently, and I can't speak to those because I haven't studied them like I have restaurants. But with a restaurant, you got to like the people who are getting into business with when it comes to your landlords, and we get along great. Uh, and, I mean, they have been so incredibly generous to me during this time. This is one of, I think it's five or six buildings that they own uh, that have restaurants in them. And they have extended the same kind of generosity to those businesses because they care about – the culture of restaurants of the area um, and what's going to be available. And they probably, I don't know these other people in these businesses, but I can imagine they're probably good business owners. So they have confidence in them getting through this and to the other side and making something out of it. Um, they actually just were talking to me really funny about another location. If I'm interested, wow. maybe because they're like, we have this other building. It's actually a home that, we could see being converted into something and you've really impressed us over this time. And I was like, thank you. Uh, this is, you know, let me get this place open first and let's put a little dog tag on that. And then we'll, we'll get back to that or earmark on that. And we'll get back to that later because, um, I want to get this place open first, but so anyway, so get the place keys in hand, November 2nd, I signed the lease to this place the day of the rehearsal dinner for our wedding, which was October 11th, get married October 12th. Go off to Italy for a couple weeks, have a fantastic honeymoon, come back, get right to work. Tons of hours painting and doing it because we did everything ourselves. That was an important thing to me for team building. I had hired on a sous chef who's going to be my right hand and become a chef de cuisine in training with me over the next period of time. I had hired my first GM and wanted to give them ownership, which was going to be literal sweat equity. Yep. I want you guys to know – and to be have some pride in the fact that you painted these walls, that you've done some of this. I hired a cleaning crew to come in to do things because I was like, I don't – when we found this place, it was a mess. And, and I didn't want to make them be responsible for that. But I do think that there's something special that happens when you painted the wall to the place you work at. Like you feel something a special – and it's a unique opportunity because we don't get this much in our industry. Um, and we bonded in a way that was really amazing through all of that. It became way closer, way closer than you ever would have. Uh, but when, you know, we started seeing things happen, we, and especially in February of 2020, we're like, oh, no. Mm -hmm. Something's coming our way, but we're not really sure yet. And then towards the end of the month, like, what's going on? And then when we got to that first week of March, we were supposed to have our first uh, family event on the 6th. And none of my family could show up because there was too much concern. I want to touch on COVID, but yeah. I want to talk about questions because you touched on two important points that I think people can extract a lot of value or practically use. And the first is around that point of interviewing the employer. Mm. So maybe the, the accurate question is if a new team member – is interviewing for a position with you. What is a question that they would ask that would make you say, "Good, good on you for asking that." You know, mm. like that's that's a good. You should be asking those questions of, of people you're interviewing with. Can can you give some examples, or does something come to mind? What you'd be like? Yeah, let me. You know, I I think. I definitely think something. I think it has to be. You have to ask a question that would. Like maybe something to the effect of like, what is your favorite part? Like, why do you love this place so much? Or uh, what is your favorite thing about these employees or this certain employee or, or something like that? Like aspects, like 
to see if they actually value those things because they should have quick answers to that stuff because that shows that they're really paying attention to what's happening around them. Um, you know, or maybe like ask them what they look for in a perfect employee, you know, uh, and those kind of questions are going to help pull, extract some information from them that you can then derive like, you know, does, is this person acutely aware of what's happening? You know, it isn't like, well, I really love when people sweep the floor well. <laughs> Duh. Mm -hmm. It's like, you could say, well, I really, you know, um, for instance, Michelle, who used to work for me, like if I was asked this question, I, I would say, you know, one of my favorite things about Michelle is that I never have to worry about things getting done because she is so proficient at her job and asks me questions about what I want versus me always dictating things to her because I love being asked questions. So we just get to the point of what we need to do that I can really trust her to do everything we need to. And if anything is going to happen, she asks me a question um, and she's, you know, really on it and she's very pleasant when guests and she's like that swan of a person who, you know, she looks, you know, even if we're kicking like hell to survive the moment, you would have no idea sure, because she is cool, calm and collected from everything I just said, you should have been able to derive a lot about what I value about how I care about how this person behaves in front of guests when things are going crazy about the kind of mannerisms, but also about the fact that I like when people ask questions, communication, the communication is number one for me. Mm. Like I, I really value that my, my mom, the way I was raised, like she's always really patient with us about things. You know, we thought we had all this freedom, but she was the one who was like smart to like set up the situation. So yeah, you know, you can have here, you know, uh, what do you want to do? Here are the options, right? Not just leaving it like, so we just, uh, you know, do whatever. It's like, she kept it really smart. So we felt like we had autonomy as kids yet. It was still within a play box that she was designing, which was very smart parenting. Um, it, it can be kind of the same way with communication is number one. So I don't, I don't yell. I've never been that person. Uh, you know, I'm try to. I really think I'm probably one of the more patient people in the kitchen you can work with. Yet still, you know, if I need to be stern about things, um, especially when it comes to physical safety. Yeah. Uh, that is the one of the few times that I will raise my voice because I just don't want somebody to get hurt past that. Like I won't, uh, you know, and I've been fortunate enough that in my business, I've never had anybody work for me who was demeaning or demoralizing or anything like that. I have worked in those kitchens. Mm. I will say that I have brushed up against some sous chefs who did not like me because I was always the kid is uh, like getting into fights with bullies because no way, no way is this going to happen. No way you're going to be this. My dad, was definitely anti-bully you know no problem you want to be that way we're gonna have we're gonna have it out i'm gonna be very nice to you first and then if you continue with this behavior we're gonna have to have a very serious talk and then if it gets to the point it's like i'm not gonna let you get by with this publicly you just demean this person i'm gonna dress you down you know would do things differently now as a business but when i was working for somebody else like eight years ago i definitely dressed down a sous chef in front of a staff because i took them aside and warned them and this comes from like Again, working at FedEx, yeah. right? Working at FedEx, learning all these management training, I gave them a few chances. I'm like, you, and the final one was like, you're being a bully. You keep this up, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna embarrass you. And I warned them and they did it again and they were really mean to someone. And it was, the person was failing because that sous chef did not take the time to teach them how to do something fairly simple. But this person was 22 years old had just got done with their internship there and got hired and was just not getting treated well. And every time I tried to teach them how to do stuff, I got told, don't help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at them like, are you insane? Sure. You're wasting money. Well, You're so wasting money by letting them mess up. How smart in a business with notoriously terrible profit margins. So, Which then causes you to over-index on things oh like value and communication God, later, it, right? Yeah, so communication's huge with me. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're gonna run a business, if you get annoyed by what you perceive as stupid questions, you might wanna reevaluate if you should be running a business that has employees. If you're a solo operator or you hire independent contractors to do certain work, maybe you're fine. But if you're not patient enough to, to answer a million and one questions um, from your employees who are just trying to do a good job, you probably don't have a place in people management. Right. 
So unless you're going to hire people, outsource that to other people, that's not the right place. And kitchens, you need to be good at that. You should be an expert communicator um, and, and be somebody who also can be a great coach. You, know, like you need to be able to root people on and understand when to back off on the micromanagement because you can drive people insane and, and know yourself in that way. And, and, you know, it's hard when you're young, you don't always get the stuff. You're not self-aware enough. Um, you know, I, I probably really got into the groove of management after, you know, when I got into my early third, I mean, mind you, I started managing staffs of about 10 and then up to 24 people when I was like 23, 24 years old. So I had a nice running start into a lot of this, uh, which has been so beneficial to my career. Um, well, yeah. what what I was going to kind of bring it back to was that I think you and I are both saying that we're, we're almost granting permission to people to ask questions of yes. their employer because that's, I mean, that's a lot of people get stuck there, right? Mm-hmm. Like they don't, they see it as, oh, well, I should just be, I should be more humble and I should not ask these questions to inquire more because it's going to make me seem like I'm a hot shot or, or whatever. That's that's the first place. So it's kind of like e- e- green light. You can ask these questions in interviews. Absolutely. And then the second one is like how to st- not just structure the question so you get the right information, but then how do you analyze that information and almost have some forethought into what type of person is this to work for? Absolutely. Right. And then to 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 circle back on the other point you made about talking to either investors or landlords, what are some questions that have either prevented you from making significant mistakes mm-hmm. with people like that or have either brought you closer to those people or kind of like given you some more insight into like, yes, this is what my business partner and I call getting business married, you yes. know, because it truly is like shared bank accounts and you're signing well, contracts together and like you share a lawyer and all of those sorts of things. So I would say what questions did you ask like if you're married, <laughs> you know, what question and you were serious say for you know say say like in retrospect day one marriage right what questions would you have asked your now wife or serious significant other to get to it like when when my wife and i met we had the most upfront conversation and and you need to know what your disqualifiers are right so in a relationship for instance if one of you wants kids and the other one doesn't don't be together I'm not trying to be harsh i'm just trying to say that person will always want kids. You're going to have dysfunction at some point over that. Um, it's okay. There's a lot of people out there, a lot of great people who you'll do really well with. Same thing happens in business. If you have someone who's not willing to negotiate on rent, and you should be asking this question day one, or at least maybe by meeting two, because meeting one a lot of times is going to be let's warm up to each other, keep things vague, don't make sure you never make anything rock solid with them other than you are a professional who is responsible and you can work with them. Like obviously that stuff, but you should be asking, don't let things go like 10 meetings or whatever. And then it's like, Oh yeah. And I can only spend this much on rent. You sure. Just wasted everybody's time. Right. And how irresponsible and rude is that? I mean, you don't want to get a reputation that you're just like wasting everybody's time. And I'll tell you that real estate agents talk with each other. You can get on a list and they will not be happy with you. And of course, in you know, People who are interested in investing in restaurants too, there's a little community of those people. Um, But why would you ever want that reputation? So I would say that you should approach it in the way that you need to know what your disqualifiers are. You need to have a range. What's, you know, the big things, right? What's the rent? How much tenant improvement or TI allowance are they gonna give you? Um, If another pandemic hits Mm. and we have to close for six months, would you extend any kind of um, rent forgiveness or free rent or percentage-based income rent or whatever? And, you know, uh, what about utilities? How are they shared? If you're going to do improvements like the hood, you know, do you pay for all of it? Or if we're installing a hood, like, for instance, the project in Fremont, you know, I can't walk away with the hood. I'm not going to, like – uninstall the hood and walk away with it, Put it you're paying truck. for that and that's yeah. not coming out of my ti mm. you're just putting that in because i can't walk away with that now if you want to because it's going to be a restaurant because the hood's going in the stove you know we could talk about that yep. we could make an investment on a piece of equipment 
that's good for 20 years because those exist if you take good care of them. And, you know, I'll pay half, you pay half kind of a thing. Interesting. Or if I'm going to pay the full boat, I'm going to probably pick a different piece of equipment, um, you know, and then take it with me when I go, you know, or if I sell it, I get to keep that profit from that. This is one of the biggest things that I learned years ago. And this is, of course, from a manager who I worked with at FedEx. His name was Ed, and he had all these isms, which were great. But he would say this. Uh, well, can I cuss? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he would say, if it ain't writ, it ain't shit. All right? And that has to do with contra- contracts. All the stuff we're talking about, that goes in. No handshake deals, yep. nothing. My other friend... Uh, would also say fences build friends when it comes to contracts. Two great things to remember. Always remember those things because those fences, now those contracts, make sure that the communication is there, that I know what I'm responsible for, you know what you're responsible for, and if we ever need to refer back to a document that we have legally signed and binds us to this, so we never have to hopefully go to a court of law to settle anything, but if we just need to get on the phone and say, hey, subsection whatever, says i do this when this happens like if there's a a plumbing issue that's not on the landlord you know that would be on me because that's what we agreed to um i was fine with that because i got a great deal on my rent because i was hard-nosed about it i'm like this is my max well i talk about it from the perspective of contracts nine times out of ten are written in peacetime Mm -hmm. and and you want that type of thinking to be applicable during wartime, yeah, you know what I mean. When con- when conflicts arise, yeah. when when the when the, the when the gloves come off, mm-hmm. that's when you want to be able to refer to this thing that we agreed on yeah. months ago, over dinner when we were having you know when we were buddy buddy, not emotionally elevated and yeah. kind of like d- tensions are high and all of that yeah. sort of stuff. And that's also why like, okay, everyone, if you actually care about looking professional, don't use. Facebook Messenger or DMs in general to conduct your business. You don't look professional. You don't. Maybe for first contact, eh, okay. But if you want to look professional, email is your only option. Don't do it by text message. And this is not because I'm like way older than I even look. It's not about that. It's about that if you have an email thread that says all these things, that can be used in a court of law. Now, it's not to say that I'm going to sue anybody, but it's also to say, like, you want to make sure that you have this stuff. Uh, And also, it also helps to jog people's memories when they forget about things three years later that they said. You have this. Mm -hmm. Um, So so in your contracts, I think that that is a great way to put it that, yeah, it's like thinking like you want to write it for if you're in war times. So game it out. What are your worst case scenarios? Like, say you put a business in like uh, this is where some of the talk about percentage-based rent starts to become very smart. Now, some people will look at it like, well, what if we're like just super successful and we make millions of dollars and now I'm paying way more? Well, you're still only paying 10% or 8% on your rent. So yes, that you're paying more money, but on percentage, you're paying exactly the same as if what you had done in your business plan worked out. Now, you... The percentage-based deals, I hear very seldomly. That That's a pretty rare thing, but I do like that that's being talked about a little bit more. I don't know for sure if that's the way to go. Mm-hmm. I don't. Um, I think that, you know, depending on your business and depending on where your ambitions lay, that's going to really dictate, you know, maybe that kind of structured deal. But, you know, when you're asking these questions to your employer, to your um, investors, to whomever – You got to make sure that they really understand where you sit. Like, do not leave things vague and do not be ambiguous about this stuff because it'll come back to bite you. And it absolutely will. Like, for instance, if you get an investor who's like, oh, I'm a big foodie and I want to, like, get into a restaurant and I want to, like, you know, and, and especially if they're, like, incredibly wealthy, they'll get in and then they might be all up in your hair all the time. And they're like, why aren't you doing it? Like this guy on TV does it. And why don't you have more time to do this? And it's like, they have no idea. And of course they don't. That's a nightmare. It is. It's why I would say, don't have those people invest in you. Like, you know, um, when choosing those, uh, I will. So when you just as a small tangent on investment, um, don't ever use your own money. 
don't ever, you know, and this is all business to me. Don't ever use your own money. Don't ever let, don't ever mortgage your house. Don't ever let anybody related to you mortgage their house. There are nightmare stories about that that we've been hearing for about decades, not just during Corona forever. Don't do that. If you can't get people to invest in you, you do not have an investable product yet. Period. Watch more Shark Tank. Mm. I mean, they purposely give out more deals than they should because it makes the TV better. And there's interviews about that. But it is a point to say that um, you need to make sure that if when pitching, if you get investors on board, that means that it's like some proof positive that they're like, yeah. And maybe not just one, like maybe have like a few so that you don't owe so much money to one person. And that also you have more people who are going to bring people to your restaurant like or whatever business it is right more people to be excited about things but you got to ask certain questions and also i'd recommend that it's a complete hands-off you know that your landlord doesn't get to dictate to you the food you got to put that in your lease agreement they're not going to dictate to you how to run your business because this does happen they will say well why aren't you open for brunch well we don't do brunch i don't cook brunch i literally have never cooked brunch in my life outside of my own home or for a friend no that's not true i did one i did one brunch service uh in a private residence when i was working at lark that was it i i'm not like i love eating brunch and i have no problem getting up early i just don't feel the same level of fulfillment cooking brunch sure sure and i don't i don't get paid a lot of money to do brunch it's just i, I just that's just how i feel and there's nothing wrong with that i um, one of my absolute favorite people to listen to is Christopher Lockhead who wrote, uh, he has a great, two great podcasts. They, he just split his podcast into many episodes and then longer form conversations with people. And he wrote a book called niche down an idea of really drilling down on a niche that don't try to be all things to everyone. Don't try to be the Jack of all trades. Like, Find your lane and own it and have it be a small one because the moment you're – whether you're in a band, whether you're in a restaurant, doesn't matter what you do. You try to appease too many masters, you're just going to fail mm -hmm. like, or, or you're going to be watered down from what you care about being. Uh, I, I think – and we have both done this and it's a part of the reason like um, – you know, it's great to have a community because I feel more su supported and more sane when I see like, uh, especially like five years ago, seeing other chefs be on a different path where it's like, we're not going to go the traditional restaurant path right away. doesn't mean we might not get there one way or another, but we're going to do this differently because we don't want that. We don't want to be celebrating a 5% profit margin that we're also paying ourselves out of. And for those of you who don't know, a lot of restaurant owners make the mistake of not putting themselves on the payroll. So yep. when you build your structure, uh, you want you want to build an S-corp. You don't want to be an LLC. Totally. There's a – look all that stuff up. Yep. There's a lot to do it. Do but your research. guess what? If you are an S-corp, then you're an employee of the business, so you pay those taxes. And in this moment right now, you would have been paying yourself unemployment, so you would have been easily eligible for – unemployment insurance and you would get paid where most people, if you're an LLC, the way all the taxation and everything works, you were never paying an unemployment for yourself, which hangs you out to dry. And they made like a special pandemic, but that's a mess in the state. Right. And so there's a lot of corporate structure things that you should do. If you're just a single person operating on your own, like when I was only doing uh, pop-ups and private dining by myself and stuff, I was an LLC that time because it just made more sense for the structure of things. Um, and because so much of it was uh, independent contractor gig work. But when opening this place up, switched over to an S-Corp immediately because it just made way more sense. Um, it's a very easy thing to do. Talk to your accountants, guys. But it makes a big difference. And, you know, it's funny. When I was in a band, all this business stuff is what I felt killed it for me. And it, it maybe it did, maybe it didn't. What, what did is I grinded too hard. It doesn't matter what I was doing. I just grinded too hard, both in, like, trying to be the best drummer I could be trying to, I didn't have good life work balance, not work life balance, life work balance. Life comes first. If your life isn't great, your work's not going to be great. So you got to make sure that's taken care of. And, you know, in, in this industry, I find that um, because of the long days and because of everything else that gets thrown out real quick and you know, the baby does go with the bath water and we forget to take care of ourselves. And so, as we were talking about earlier, you have to build that in to 
your lifestyle and and that way you can have a really enriching um uh, career but also you will take care of yourself on the things that matter when it comes to your contracts with whether it's your investors and especially your landlords because you're going to be in bed with them for a long time depending on the structure you know if you're like a uh, if you're somewhere for 10 years and you have investors i mean you might be paying them the whole time and people change and they have kids or maybe some you know life dynamic changes and they have new priorities uh you got to make sure that those contracts protect you from that stuff and there's nothing wrong with that it, if you feel uncomfortable with that kind of stuff get a lawyer to help you it's worth every penny it's worth every penny it's going to seem like a lot of money you're not going to feel that in the moment that instant gratification of doing that but no that they will have protected you and acted on your behalf to make sure that you are fine and make sure to, if it's for a restaurant specifically, um, find lawyers who deal in that specifically. Don't use like your family lawyer, don't use a family member period, but don't use a family lawyer or something like that. Use somebody who specializes in it because our industry is so unique and there are new labor laws within even the last few years and things that are being put in that they will be brushed up on but a normal lawyer why would they care they're not like you know so there's also an element of like you have to admit that you don't know something yeah. which when you're at that point in your career when you are the go-to source of knowledge for a lot of the questions it's a little bit i i i don't want to use the word humbling but it's almost like you have to admit like i need to put my hand up for help with this it, it, when I worked at FedEx, one of the big things they talked to us uh, as managers was delegate and follow up. It seems so simple and it seems like, yeah, duh. But you know how bad we are in this industry of that, especially as chefs, because there's like this measuring contest. I'll leave out. Yeah. We all know what <laughs> I'm talking about. Uh, but it is. It's like this ego measuring contest. And, you know, men and women both are bad about it because our work is there's this competitive like at being an athlete like when i played hockey played ice hockey all through high school um and elementary school too like there's instant gratification being better than someone about something and and there's this m obvious meritocracy which is one of like the infectious things about working a line like you know when you are more efficient you waste less you cook perfectly that skin on that fish is like crispy and awesome and it is cooked right to the perfect doneness for whatever it is you're you know you you're working in the flow of things and then you especially when you get proficient it is so much fun especially when you're with a team that like gets it um and you can have that flow together and like and there's so many great podcasts and stories and things that you can read about that workflow that is awesome. Um, I think that you have to protect, and I know we keep coming back to this, but it's so important that, you know, the business stuff. And as I was saying before, you know, uh, that it can burn you out. A lot of people are like, ah, I don't want to deal with the business stuff, whatever. And you're not going to have a choice unless you have just a bunch of money to delegate all that to other people. So you have to get okay with that. And you do need to teach, you need to learn these things. You need to know Excel. You need to, and again, got to credit FedEx. I learned a lot working there. I already knew how to use Excel, but Illustrator and the whole Adobe suite, back in those days when I worked for them, uh, we used all those programs. Now they all have, now they have proprietary programs. They use it. They built software for themselves based off that stuff so that they didn't have to license it anymore. Um, but for me, it was great. So I got to know all this stuff. So you know that knowing all of that's great but you got to make sure you have that life balance so that the creative end the you know going to the farms and seeing these and building that in keeps that lifeblood of why you got in this in the first place because i'll tell you you probably didn't get into this to like be on quickbooks and care about you know payroll taxes and you know then beg the state um you know when you're paying your sales tax beg them because you're two days late to not pay the penalty fee and hope that they'll have some mercy. Like you didn't get into this for all those things, but they're all necessary and they're just part of it. Um, and it's okay, you know, but make sure that you balance that. And uh, you can find gratification in the business stuff. I mean, my brain's maybe a little more wired for some of that because I do like it, but you need to be comfortable in that. Um, and if you're not, you need to find someone who is and will own it and pay them pay them well, take care of them. They are, you know, that's your, like your work spouse. 
take really good care of them because they're going to be like a golden goose for you long term. Uh, there is not enough that can be said about somebody who can work in house as like your bookkeeper, accountant, and do all those things. They are worth their weight in gold and more so. We've we've gone off on a lot of tangents, but yeah, I, and I'm I, and I, that. <laughs> I, I I wanted to ask one more question before we kind of go into rapid fire because a lot of people might be hearing all of this and they're like this is four steps ahead of where I'm at. Yeah. I'm not I'm not quite there yet. But what I think your experience lends to so valuably is this arguably textbook example of sous chef at a well-known restaurant in the city go off to do a pop-up to test a concept and attract investors open the brick and mortar place. Mm-hmm. Like that has been your path for the past 5 years like yeah. that's and it's been executed like like I'm saying textbook going back would you do it again in that fashion or do you have any insight for people who are at the place you were at when you left Lark? Mm. um i might i mean it's so hard right uh, uh you know maybe we'll travel just a little bit more i did a good amount of traveling but maybe a little bit more uh before settling in so deep to get more inspired or to just because yeah. for fun yeah. like and it probably would have led to more inspiration frankly because i'm sure w- with your travel too it's centered around eating so often but i would i would definitely have probably traveled just a little bit more um you know and there's a variety of reasons why i didn't uh t- maybe take a little bit more time for me because once you get into the the grind of running your own business um then you really realize like how much stuff you didn't know uh but i would say i'd keep a lot of it the same and, and i think the reason for that is that I feel very, you know, to make sure that it's it's obvious, I didn't start doing this when I was 20, like a lot of people are in their careers. I was already, when I went off on my own, I was 33 years old uh, or 32 years old. So because of that, I had a lot of life experience that helped me make good decisions to be able to get to where I needed to go. It doesn't mean that there wasn't failure along the way, but you know, the po- the way that I did things, I would recommend to pretty much everybody. You know, running a pop-up, almost no matter the industry that you're in, there is some form of that where you can make proof positive of your concept and and build a culture and do things like you've talked about on your podcast. Get a newsletter. Get people on that newsletter. Collect those emails. Push it hard um, because you can build a culture around that, you know. And if you have the time to, you know, bring people along with you on the journey through your social media or whatever, like that's great because – it is a fantastic thing to allow people in. Like you do not need to just show all the glory. If you do, um, there will be a level of it being disingenuous. It just gets there. Like, because people know, Mm -hmm. people know that you have dirty laundry. You, you wear, you have dirty clothes like everybody else and you don't need to show the dirty clothes, but you can talk about it every once in a while. And if you look at my social media, yeah, not all the pictures are absolutely perfect because I don't believe in that philosophically. I think that there, it just makes it fake. And people sniff that out in a minute and they're that person, like whatever, like they don't know what it's like to actually work hard or they don't know, or, um, it's boring cause it's too perfect and pristine. And so, and I think that we're actually getting into a part of our culture where that's better. So pop up, do the pop up because you'll, you'll get people around you. And in the food industry, if you do that, that's where you might inspire those people that want to invest in you, that see the potential in that. Um, that maybe have a building that's opening up or have the pop-up because you'll be searching for places and maybe you'll find a great venue like I did before this when I was working at the Ballard Loft where I almost became the resident chef basically there and I got an amazing deal with them, like a total sweetheart deal to do my you know, my dinners there and whatnot. And it was on an off night of the week so that there, when they had events, they would have the prime nights. Like that is the way to do it. You almost open yourself up to like the serendipity of it. Yeah. You know? and, and so, you know, and then I worked in a commissary kitchen and when I first started, I had the most basic rate. I, I'm a, I really follow pragmatism, like slow, steady, planned growth, a little bit at a time. If, you know, if every year in my business can like 1.6 X, not 2.5 X, cause that's a little much and probably gambling a little bit on things, who knows, but you know, if we can make steady growth, regularly there's versus that. feast or famine yeah right which is gonna happen because mm-hmm. yeah you'll be hot and every restaurant has its first year or two where they're just like slamming things are great what about the third what about the fourth mm-hmm. right 
you can't plan for that. It's also why, like, I don't think restaurants should be open on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. They're bluebirds. They're random occurrences of a huge wealth of income that comes in that you do not, you can't consistently maintain. It's why I base our financials on a 48 week year, not a 52, because that way I know I can be fully closed. Um, I'm not counting on that revenue. Uh, people can have their vacations and do their things, yet my bills are based on a 52. So revenue on a 48, bills on a 52, and, and making that work. But the um, the pop-up and, and taking your time, but also, yeah, working for other people. Um, you know, I worked at, uh, and I was a part of two different openings, so I could really see some of that. You know, uh, learn to fail on other people's money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not a... That, I'm Great not, advice. I'm not saying that to be glib or to, to be whatever. I'm saying, like, if you learn to get comfortable with failing while you're learning, when you go out on your own, you'll have so much knowledge. And if you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Mm -hmm. You know, like, go after it and, and, and do that and learn from your mistakes. But fail on other people's money and then um, work at the best places that you can find within the genre and work at a variety of places. I mean, the one thing I wish I would have done was work at a hotel prior to just going off on my own um to learn scale or to, to yeah it did some of the interest on it. there's some like if anything because of the private dining catering that i do i know there's some things that are um and also just business function you know that's mm. why i worked at canlis you yeah know, and those guys knew when they hired me like uh they you know uh, this isn't meant to sound uh um, arrogant or anything, but like my experience level lent to like, why are you trying to just be a line cook? Yep. Why aren't you trying to be a sous chef? Yep. And I was like 31 getting a job there. They're like, you have a lot of experience. Like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I, cause I was working my side hustle with Sorel. I was like, I can only work four days a week. Like if you guys are cool with a four day a week sous chef, they're like, yeah, no, well, you know, obviously I'm like, yeah, trust me, I get it. But if you change your mind, like four days a week, I'm down, I'll, I'll kill it for you. Um, but those guys have proved how important a private dining aspect to your restaurant is. Uh, that place is so impressive when it comes to how they run their business. Um, and they have made so many good decisions in buying the land. You know, they own the building and stuff. And if you listen to stuff that Thomas Keller has said in the past, you like he, they own the French laundry, like they own that property. And yep. you, you know, you feel very differently when you're invested at that level. Um, I'm not saying that people need to go do that, but what I am saying is that it makes sense to go work for a place that runs as a business. And so I went there to test, kind of test my theory that private dining, having a private di dining room bare minimum could be a massive money generator. And instead of like a five to 10% profit margin, we jump up to a 15 to 22% profit margin. You know, like that's what I'm looking at. Food cost, like my goal is to keep food cost at 15%. Same and labor, labor. I'm willing to go like 35% because like I want to give good benefits. But then, you know, like when you put the food and the labor together, we're still way under what the, you know, the 30, 30, correct. That people, you know, talk about, which is just silly. Yeah. Like yep. from the days of old. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, but do these things work for those people work for the great places that are doing that. But yeah, if I would have worked at a, a hotel, you know, it would have been great to work at like a like a boutique one, like, uh, you know, what they've got going on with like the Meadowood. Yeah, I mean, poor Meadowood, but yeah, like what they were doing and everything like, man, I would have loved to see just because some of the operation of, you know, in anywhere that's like that, because like I have some aspirations down the road of like doing a B and B. Like I have some ideas that I think could be super fun, like what Massimo mm -hmm. decided to do. I'm like, man, you're so smart. Yeah. Like you're yeah. one of the smartest, most creative people on this planet with one of the biggest hearts like that guy is incredible and i just uh so that was one thing that i wish i could have had a little bit more experience in there's some when you get to a certain point in your career um and i think a lot of people can attest to this and i'm sure you can too like you don't need to go work at a certain style restaurant to understand how to make a dish better yet go eat that food there and then you can do some research and probably figure out how to make the whatever it is i say that all the time yeah, yeah and i think people get lost in the weeds on that mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. um and that's definitely an old school thought sure, i think sure. that, but i think like you can gain a lot just from going to the place of business and getting the vibe and hang out there and eat the food a bunch and study a lot uh those things are, are super helpful well we could 
clearly keep going, but I'm going to yeah, transition I talk, into. <laughs> it, it, I, I make this joke with people like when we do, uh, especially winemakers dinners or uh, lar- when I was doing larger pop ups. Uh, when it would be like 20 people and we would be doing like a seven to eight course tasting menu and everything, I would make the joke at the beginning of the meal and I'd have to remind the guests, like, make sure you start eating when the dish comes out to you, especially the warm ones, because um, I appreciate you like waiting for me to introduce the dish. But if you wait and we start like a guest asks a question, and I go off on a tangent. Aaron's going to keep going. Oh, man. <laughs> it, it's like I said, and I know I said this before, <laughs> lifelong goal of being more concise. <laughs> uh, All you good. Know, we just have more reason to eventually, you know, have a follow up. Have an episode two. <laughs> and this is what rapid fire questions are okay. for. I'd be curious. I, I asked this question from the perspective of a book, but you can talk about a podcast. What is a book that's been particularly impactful in your career or an interview or Ooh, article? Uh, Years ago, the tipping point, Malcolm and, Gladwell. Yeah, uh, a f- him in general, and then uh, Jordan Harbinger podcast. I'll call them out, and uh, the Christopher Lockhead podcast. Both those uh, really, really great. Nice. Um, there's all kinds of good snippets in there. Name an ingredient you're obsessed with right now. Mm. Oat, uh, oats, oats. Yeah. As in using it as flour or just like? Like oats. uh, Like right now on the menu, we have uh, oatmeal porridge as a savory dish with mushrooms. And we season it with aged soy and fish sauce. And I I know I'm not the first one by any means to do this. But like. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to do a lot of uh, broken rice, like more congee-like. And I really like those a lot. But I've just done them so much that I'm like, I need, and we were just like talking one day, and I'd been eating a lot of oatmeal for breakfast, and my sous chef was like, we were talking, he's like, yeah, you know, what if, like, have we ever thought about, like, doing the savory? I'm like, ah, well, I remember I saw, like, Brian Baltaglio do it with, like, Skate Wing or something, like, years ago. I'm like, let's just try it. And so we started doing, like, damn, okay, this, like, a really good, like, roasted chicken stock as a base for it, cooked risotto style, is so good. That's tight. Oh, man. You picked today's beverage which is a kombucha flavored with blood orange hibiscus and rose thank you for doing that yeah what are your thoughts on it i love it i'm gonna i'm gonna just not to get into too much no, uh, AS- asmr yeah <laughs> yeah which you know everyone has their own pain tolerance but just to have a brief taste i think it's really nice you know i'm a huge fan of acidity mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is why i love wine so much um and but with this like you know, it's citrus season right now. We're one the the final bite you get from us in the night is a, a little lollipop looking thing that's in this little box with stones and it's a piece of dark chocolate ganache wrapped in a mandarin orange and ginger cotton candy. And so when I tried this, I was like, oh, Yeah. That's the one. That's I'm like I need to figure out – I need to make a hard candy that has, like, hibiscus infused in it now, too, because the sourness that you get from super from good. this is super good. And so it's just like – well, and that little bit – like, when rose is used correctly, Agreed. it is so good. But, mm-hmm. man, does it get abused. Yeah. So this was, like, when I tried it. And, and this company in general, like, they'll do these uh, very seasonal blends, and I – they're awesome. Yeah. Like they're just, yeah, they're awesome. No. Like this, you could easily like just like slice some hamachi and like pour this with it, and like, you know, totally. that's that's like a uh, at least a one Michelin star dish right there. Yep. You know, yep. <laughs> like, yep. you know what I mean? Awesome it, choice. It would be funny. No, awesome choice. Let's see which one. Um, how do you make your eggs in the morning? Ooh, on I, your day off, I, that brunch I'm, you make at your house. I, you know, oh God, us. Uh, silly chefs i'm I'm (laughs) such a soft scramble whore 100 percent. i mean let me tell you my wife like when when i did that she'd never had like she'd had a soft scramble from like a restaurant but there is something unique if you get that soft scramble within the first few seconds of it coming out of the pan with like hot buttered toast where the butter like the toast is warm but the butter hasn't melted fully so you get the texture of the butter still and that egg on there man uh as a really really quick side tangent uh in the spring, working at Lark, the original Lark location, if anybody ever wants to hear about something like that, about what that kitchen was like, uh, you should send me an email or DM me because that was the most unique kitchen situation ever uh, to cook in. The best ever. I learned so much. But Friday, Saturday nights in the spring, soft scramble, we would make it. 
um, with like buttery peas and, and and brioche like soldiers. It was awesome. Friday, Saturday night, there was only one saute cook there. Whoa. So you have to stop everything you are doing at 7 p.m. or whenever they order it <laughs> to <laughs> perfectly make a perfect Bermonte in a pan. And we're talking all of this is like French technique. No xanthan gum, no heavy cream, no nothing to help this. Your perfect butter sauces. John, an amazing chef. Uh, I owe him and Lauren Thompson, who's the chef de cuisine at Cafe Juanita currently, more credit than I could ever probably explain about helping me develop technique that I'm obsessive about. Sure. And some of that's in me, yes, but man, did they help that, cultivate that in me. Uh, but yeah, just if you can imagine, like have to stop everything, grab the one nonstick saute pan we have to make a perfect soft scramble while doing your, while cooking the fish and the steaks and yada, yada. I mean, nuts, totally nuts. That place, I yeah. mean, that old, uh, you know, this place will make boys or men out of boys or whatever. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you, it was beyond that. And John incredibly pleasant the entire time and professional sure. and never, I mean, we knew because it was like. The look of a disappointed parent. And that was like knives to the heart. So sucks. You somehow get a call right after this interview that you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant. And when you get there, there's someone you've always wanted to talk with waiting to have dinner with you. What is that restaurant and who is that dinner guest? Oh, man. Um, you know, and it's funny. I listen to your podcast. <laughs> and I know this question is coming up, but like it's. Uh, it's it's hard for me uh you know i would say the best meal of my life happened and i was so lucky that we went there right before we en all entered into the coronavirus was single thread um you know and uh, three michelin star restaurants have a, a habit of not necessarily always being absolutely delicious ambiance stuff can be great but absolutely delicious and perfect so i would say that place would be great um, but if I had a choice of anybody, the, the person's hard. I mean, I'd love to talk to, I'd love to talk to either myself 20 years from now or myself from 20 years ago. Yeah. I think it'd be really interesting if I had that choice. I hope we get to that place where Man, we can that'd do be that. that'd so cool. Yeah. Well, and, and that's why this stuff, and thank you, by the way, for having me on your podcast. Totally. This stuff is so awesome because it helps us. I've, I've started and I'm trying to be better about this, just doing a audio journal when I'm driving to work. Cause I have about a 45 minute drive both ways and just kind of talking about things about where my head's at because when I've always kept a journal of dishes and things and making little notes and it's always so fascinating to look back at that but I'd say single thread the other place that and and this might be even better because it's just yummy but like any great Mexican restaurant doing like traditional like Oaxacan like I just I love that food or barbecue and the person, it's hard because there's so many people who, I mean. I always add it can be living or dead if you have, like, yeah. a historical figure that you. You know, I'm one of those funny people. Like, I've never been a, I've never really had, like, celebrity crushes or sure. anything like that sure. necessarily. But I think out of fascination of just talking with someone, like, I think it would be really interesting to sit down with, like, um, oh. Like, uh, I mean, honestly, uh, man, this is hard. It's okay. It, it, it's hard because I always feel like I'd be leaving somebody out. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say, like, it would be really great to sit down with, like, a younger David Kinch. Sure. You know, when I ate a Manresa, I've been fascinated with Manresa. The guy has so many philosophies towards things, but I would love – when he was about two years in um, to chat with him about where he was at with things. Because I think like you're talking about a guy who's a chef chef who really only had one restaurant and only like way later started to open up more, but like not many. And you know, he was in his fifties by that time where you see all these other people, it's like, Oh, you need to have 10 restaurants. And by the time you're like 40 years old and do all this. And instead he like stuck to the craft in such an intense way. Um, but Christopher crossed out too. Yeah. He should come to dinner too. Cause that would be super cool. I mean, not, not just to say like it's Michelin star chefs, but I think that these people have such a unique way of thinking that as some perspective in a career that I'm in, you'd uh, want to be at that table. I'd love to be at that table just to like 
get some insight into where their creative brains are because sometimes I feel that I'm on a little bit of an island, which is why like I appreciate talking with you and yeah. a couple of other friends that we have that we're doing things so non-traditionally. I mean, again, I'm not Sorrel when we're able to open back our doors again. Uh, my business fun like uh, we're not going to be open four days a week. My business plan when we were originally going to open this place, the taste menu was going to be one day a week, Thursday nights. That was it because I didn't want to become a slave to my own creation. And when you open up a restaurant that's open five, six, seven days a week and your sous chef's sick, guess what? You're mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. Don't be open seven days a week. <laughs> Give yourself a day off that's guaranteed. Uh, I can't stress that kind of stuff the most. So it's a life work balance and no, not a work life balance. I love that phrase of yours. In, in true sense of place fashion, we have rain pattering down on the, <laughs> on the roof here. So I think we will end this episode one here. Uh, is there anywhere that you want to send people or like I'm going to link all, all your yeah. stuff in the show notes so I mean, people can find you? Check out, uh, you know, SorelSeattle.com. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that's the best place because you can get to the, you know, Instagram. Everything's backslash Sorel Seattle. Uh, to, to find to find me whether it's Facebook or Instagram or whatever um, but uh, definitely the website um, Instagram is probably where I hang out the most uh, as far as posting and stuff like that but yeah uh, you know for anybody who has questions about anything we talked about today email is always best just because we can keep a more linear kind of thought process of what we're talking about so Aaron at SorelSeattle.com is, is a great way to get in touch with me. And I'm an open book. Uh, I'm wearing every single hat to the business right now, so I apologize if it takes me a day or two to get back to you. But um, I'm really good about getting back to people and building a better culture and community and one that's both empathetic but also, like, well-planned is a big goal of mine is just to share. And so I'm an open book. Nothing's proprietary. Reasons I'm happy to champion you, man. Thank you. I Thanks appreciate again. it. Thank you. Sorry, everyone, for talking so much. No apologies. Love Thanks it. for being on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. What's up? Justin here again, because, I mean, if you're still listening, you didn't not like this episode, right? And if that's the case, I'd like to think that you'd get value from the other work that I share here online. It's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week called the 80-20 Edge. That's where I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. And I say it saves time because I include all of the content that I published that week all in one place as kind of a weekly digest of sorts. Next up, you should check out my YouTube channel for gear reviews, clips from podcasts just like this one, and documented experiences from some of the best restaurants in the world. And lastly, if you'd like to learn about my intense cohort-based professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or just support the show, you can check out justinconnacom slash support. And if you do support this show already, that's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Finally, it really does help to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts to help the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.